All right, thank you. So this discussion will center around housing justice in New York and the United States. It will generally follow a format of first describing the structural problems in the American housing system that cause chronic housing insecurity, uh, defunded public housing, and mass homelessness. And then we will discuss alternative systems to housing and how community organizing and political organizing are the tools of achieving the structural change needed. Finally, we will end with questions from the audience. Throughout this panel, please feel free to enter your questions into the chat and we will pose them to the panel toward the end of this event. And without further ado, let's introduce our panelists. Excellent, so beginning, um, Karen Blundell is the executive director and co-founder of the Public Housing Civic Association in New York City, a community liaison for the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine. And she's the newly elected uh, resident association president of the Red Hook Houses, as well as the current Loeb Fellow at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Her organizing work is concerned with rebuilding deteriorated public housing and involves education around climate change adaptation and mitigation and political education workshops to empower marginalized communities. Moving on, Liz McGriff is an activist and community organizer at the Citywide uh, Tenant Union in Rochester, New York. She is also a founder of the City Roots Community Land Trust, also in Rochester, which formed after she and Take Back the Land organized to successfully defend against her bank um, when they attempted to foreclose her house and evict her from her home. And Robert Robinson is an adjunct professor of urbanism at the New School Parsons School of Design. He is a co-founder of the Take Back the Land movement and member of its leadership committee. And he is currently a special advisor at Partners for Dignity and Rights, among many other national and international housing organizing positions. Two decades ago, Robert experienced homelessness for nearly three years, and it was this lived experience that uh, it was this lived experience that led him to the critical perspective toward housing that he will share with us tonight. And finally, Sia Weaver is the campaign coordinator at Housing Justice for All, housing organizer with the Democratic Socialists of America, one-time nominee for the New York City uh, City Planning Commission, and a prominent presence in all things New York housing. Uh, welcome to our panelists, and thank you once more for joining. Um, so in our first half, I would, uh, I would like to start by asking our panelists to um, simply describe the problems with housing as it currently exists, as you see it from, your, uh, from the perspective of your organizing work. And um, Sia, I would like to start with you, if you could describe kind of the power imbalances involved in housing right now. Wow, I wasn't expecting to have to go first, <laughs> but Sorry happy to do so. Can, no worries, can you guys hear me okay? Awesome, well, thank you everyone for having me and I am really lucky to be in the presence of such amazing co-panelists, um, really amazing housing organizer that's an activist across the state. So I'm really honored to be here with them. Um, so. I work as a um, campaign coordinator at Housing Justice for All, which is a statewide coalition of over 80 grassroots tenant unions and organizations of homeless New Yorkers fighting for housing justice in Albany. And what I know from doing that work is that the real estate industry is far and away the most powerful presence in our state capital. Um, and they do that in two ways. You know, they also, they have a lot of power when it comes to simply donations, but it's also deeper than that, right? Um, the real estate industry is able to really like shape the discourse and shape the thinking about so many issues that like um, that shape how our policymakers think. Um, so that means that our policymakers are quite often thinking about homeowners before they're thinking about renters because we are trained to think that like homeowners are more likely to vote. Um, so there's that power imbalance that shows up in Albany. Um, and then simply when it comes to, you know, where we, so that's sort of like a political power imbalance that, that we're trying to attack by fighting for um, statewide tenant rights policies like good causes of the are probably top priority in Albany right now. Um, another sort of power imbalance in our state capital is just that there are so many people who are elected, who are landlords or who are homeowners, who are not renters, right? So there's not actually that many tenants who hold um, power in, in our political system. 
Um, and that matters, right? Because the bills that we are fighting for are overwhelmingly popular with voters. Um, every time we do a poll, it's really like everyone believes that the things that we're fighting for are good and just, but the people who policymakers in Albany believe that they're representing do not end up supporting these things. And that's sort of, that's terrible. That's like a terrible state of affairs. Um, when you're taking a step back from the political system and we're really just thinking about like how people live, the reality is that right now for you know millions of New Yorkers, they're living basically at the behest of their landlords. Um, it is simply far too easy for your landlord to push you out of your home. It is far too easy for um, your landlord to raise your rent to a level that you can't afford. And all of that is baked into sort of centuries of public policy in this country, a country that really was founded as a real estate. This is not like first a democracy. The United States is a real estate company first and a democracy second from, you know, the moment that, you know, Europeans set foot on this land, right? Um, and the reality is, is that our entire political system is structured around the rights of people who own property and not the right to housing. And that shows up in ways big and small for renters and homeless New Yorkers every day in our state. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you, Sia, very thorough. Um, so we do have a panelist who has experienced this you know, very uh, lopsided dynamic of power. Um, Liz, I was wondering if you could talk about uh, your experience with um, your bank trying to foreclose your home and uh, their attempts to evict you from your home? Um, it was, you know, when I originally brought my home, it was, you know, a very, um, it was a very, you know, liberating experience. It was an opportunity for me to um, build some generational wealth for my children. Um, and then a set of circumstances um, happened um, where I lost my job and I could no longer um, pay for the home. And so, um, so when I did go to reapply for, you know, different type of employment, it was at a lower rate than what I was originally making. So it just made it impossible for me to catch up um, from being behind. And so the bank foreclosed on my home. And then um, through the foreclosure process, um, there was a point of negotiation and um, the bank sent me a letter saying, you know, because we're in negotiation, we can't, you know, continue with the foreclosure. So I thought, you know, I have some breathing room. Um, but then, you know, a week later, I found out that um, the bank went through with the foreclosure and um, basically was, you know, telling me to get out um, without no, you know, other, no other, other notice. And I got a little angry. I got a little upset. And um, then somebody came knocking on my door um, from Take Back the Land. And they said, we can help you with this. <laughs> and um, at first, when I looked, I was a little nervous. You know, I kind of peeked around the door and said, OK, who are you? <laughs> you know, I had my um, I had my own, you know, how I was going to bring myself out of this. I had my own, um, you know, mechanism. I was going to use the system to kind of help me, you know, they had lawyers that could help with this. So I went through the process and um, just going through the process was, um, you know, even though I had a job, I had to take off job, my work just to go to the court system to try to get this turned around. And um, just, I kind of just, I think my, with my situation, I just fell through the cracks, even though there was a way to save my home, um, I fell through the cracks and, you know, the bank just proceeded. Um, the court system gave the bank, you know, what pretty much everything that they wanted, everything they asked for, and did not even regard, you know, what I was saying. Well, I have income. I do. I'm able to pay a certain amount, but um, but the bank really wanted the home. So um, so they proceeded with the foreclosure. Um, I went through four eviction attempts. And um, because I did, you know, take the advice of the folks that knocked on my door <laughs> and said, hey, we can help you and got a lot of community support around it. 
and started telling my story. So, um, you know, I went through five evictions, eviction attempts. And, you know, every time they said, we're going to come on this date, we had a crowd of people on my lawn saying, you know, we don't want this to happen to people in our community. We don't want the police involved in this. We just, we want um, to negotiate, you know, a different, a different means of um, just taking foreclosures for taking people's homes, just keep people, pe keeping people in their homes. And so, um, so the, um, the fifth time I was evicted and I was out of my home in a, for a month. Um, and then I just got so angry and just so mad because I felt like this was an injustice because I put so much sweat equity into that home and it was something that I'm losing and just, you know, um, losing a future for my kids. I, I, I also put, you know, some of my 401k in to kind of save the home because it was a long period of time where I wasn't working. So I was using that, those funds to kind of um, keep me, you know, so to be able to survive. And so you know, I, I just got angry. And so I ended up going back into my home and, you know, talking to the bank and negotiating, saying, you know, this is this is an outrage. This is unfair. This is not right. And um, the community still supported. Um, the bank said, we're still going to evict you. They said, um, <laughs> But um, we had a lot of a series of programs on my front lawn. We had lawn. We had ministers come out and saying this is an injustice. This is not fair to the community. The community should have you know a say so of who you know they want in their community. And um, and you know through a series of actions, we were able to um, get the bank to um, resell my home back to me at 15% um, of the market value of the home, which, which it took a lot of community support. And um, like I said, we had ministers on the lawn, we had sermons on the lawn, we had music on the lawn. Um, we had a cookout and we invited the neighbors down the street. So we did a lot of um, background stuff just to bring attention to it. Um, the media was there um, each night and, you know, saying, you know, keep this person in their home. So there was a lot of um, things that happened on, 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 you know, those days. And it, there was one day they came, they were going to come in the middle of a snowstorm to take my home. And I got pictures, I didn't bring them, but, um, you know, the snow is this high and, and, um, and you know, there's people out there shoveling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was a community event and it was um it was great um because it you know showed there was community support and we wanted like a different structure a different way and something else to happen so um so you know after you know during that time period we were kind of forming the city roots community land trust and so there was three people um um, St. Joseph's House of Hospitality was supporting as well as um, as well as Take Back the Land and um, myself and we kind of um, started you know doing the paperwork for doing forming the CLT and then we had set up a board with the um, St. Joseph House of Hospitality's board and they were willing to um, because they already had the Dorothy Day house, which is a house which is very um, affordable and the tenants, you know, really have, they pay very low rent. Um, so, so they thought this would be a good model to follow after. So then, you know, the, um, the City Roots Community Land Trust was um, formed and um, my home was one of the first homes to go into the City Roots Community Land Trust. And now it's um, affordable for years to come, even for next generation, um, which That's is great. a different different way of looking at things. Totally, totally. And I wanna come back to that later in the panel and, and hear more about the, um, you know, the structure of that community land trust. Um, but uh, yeah, it's really an incredible story. Um, 
it's, you know, I think what bothers me is how very uh, minor disruptions in someone's life can end up totally destabilizing them by making them unable to afford their housing suddenly. And, you know, one uh, respite for, for, you know, many, many thousands of people uh, from that sort of dynamic is public housing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, unfortunately, public housing has been uh, defunded at the national level for decades and decades now. And um, Karen, I know that you are a community organizer uh, involved in public housing. I was wondering if you could tell us about the uh, state of public housing right now as you see it. Sure, um, thank you for having me. My name is Karen Blondell. Um, I'm a public housing advocate and organizer uh, in Brooklyn. Um, and I must say that uh, when I hear these stories from uh, other panelists, um, it's, it's devastating to hear that everybody is going through so much. I mean, I have a, a person up here in Harvard with me in this fellowship um, who was a top executive and he was living in 500 uh, square feet and feeling really like uh, substandard conditions in New York City. And I'm sure he was able to pay more rent than I was or I'm able to pay. So that really points to the fact that we have a lot of deteriorating uh, infrastructure and built environment throughout New York City. And we, we grandfathered in a lot of these properties in regards to toxins, in regards to repairs. And um, I feel that, uh, well, doing my research, I realized that it's not just the uh, disinvestment by the federal government, but it also is the way the money is handed down. So the federal government, as we saw in the last eight years, um, can pivot like a pendulum. And so we had a Republican administration in and um, things were very volatile. Things were very different. Each, each administration gets to a point their uh, uh, heads and commissioners and, and uh, friends and family for, for that matter. Um, and so when you deal with Black America, those who migrated from 1917 to 1970 who find themselves veil pinned in public housing in New York City, you have to really take a moment and think about what that means. Um, we're still in a state where uh, I don't feel comfortable moving around at least 40% of the states that make up the United States of America. Um, we use uh, underground railroads and all kinds of things. Uh, and some of them are still around thanks to advocacy in, in lower uh, Manhattan and Brooklyn because we wanted to come to areas where we had more freedom. But we, again, found ourselves um, inheriting buildings that were built in the 1930s. And these buildings had all kinds of toxins from asbestos to lead-based paints, um, the rises, the gas rises, the uh, uh, waste traps, the sewage, all of those lines when Black people started moving into public housing in numbers in the 70s and 80s. Um, those things were already 50, 60 years old. So I don't think we've ever had anything as a, uh, as a community that was new. We always get the hand-me-down uh, uh, infrastructure from others, um, even during urban renewal, even during these different processes. And so we find ourselves disinvested not only by the uh, federal government, but also by the state and by the municipality. Over and over, we hear everybody pointing fingers saying, no, the money goes that way. No, it goes this way. We really need a political education in public housing so that we can understand who our targets are because we wind up wasting a lot of time talking to the wrong people. And so that brings me to what's happening in public housing now. Most public housing in New York City is built around waterfronts or in lowlands. So one thing we're dealing with is the ramifications of climate change, 
and this deteriorating um, infrastructure, as well as uh, the divestment of, of these areas. And so back in the Obama days, they came up with a, a program called RAD, Rental Assistance Demonstration. This was created by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. And um, in New York City, it would only in its best days cover 60,000 of 176,000 units. So that's the first thing I wanna make clear to people is that when you hear about this rental assistance demonstration, it's appropriated by the uh, federal government. And so it will be based on appropriations going forward. Uh, these appropriations usually cover 15 to 20 years and they're willing to, or we can voluntarily as the state of New York act for this rental assistance demonstration, which is the vehicle that New York City uses to, uh, to create this uh, system is called PAC permanent affordability commitment together. So RAD and PAC go hand in hand. RAD is the money or the authorization if you wanna convert to public private partnership and PAC is the New York City way that they get it done. This is very controversial to public housing residents because nobody's explaining it like I am. It takes time, even the way I'm explaining it to you you know, it has to be said and you have to realize it over time exactly what's being said in regards to RAD. But RAD, one of the things that it does, it provides New York City Housing Authority a way to rehabilitate and repair its units without depending on additional taxpayer money. We get a lot of money from the federal government for public housing. Um, but when that money comes down, it passes through the state of New York. The state of New York then decides whether to send it downstate, which New York City is called, or upstate, because there is public housing upstate New York. And so I don't feel like we get our fair share. I feel like it's a form of redlining. Um, we don't get our fair share in New York, just based on the number of Blacks, Black descendants of slaves and Indians who are congested inside of New York City Housing Authority in these vertical um, structures. Uh, another thing that they were thinking of doing was something called infill, but um, infill would be placing a market rate building on the underutilized uh, open space at each development. Um, in my opinion, they look at that more as like which development could get the most uh, uh, per square foot rather than looking at it as which one has the most underutilized space. So um, that, that's an issue for me in and of itself with that one. And then finally, I wanna explain something called Resident Management Corporations, because I think that Rob and Ms. McGriff, uh, when you talk about how you were able to, uh, it, it, it took a lot and it took persistence and you had it, and you got through this and you got a community land trust together. But I'm also um, uh, always hearing from resident leaders about, we want a resident management corporation. Well, I looked it up. It's not an easy thing to do. It can be done, but it is not something that you will be able to do overnight. And I feel like if resident leaders really wanted this, it's been on the book for decades. You can learn a little bit maybe by partnering up with Rob or someone. And then finally, the thing is the preservation trust. So uh, there was a big lawsuit in New York City back in 2018. Thousands of children were um, poisoned with lead and the city had fraudulently um, filled out uh, affidavits that this uh, lead was either contained or non-existent. Um, the residents really came and spoke out about other conditions like vermin, like broken pipes, like leaks, like mold. And so through a court order, we received a federal monitor and we received a uh, CEO. 
And the CEO's job was to come up with another alternative to save public housing. Uh, because if you recall, in 2018, when this was all in the news, um, it, and, and uh, uh, President Trump was still in office, uh, the threat was receivership, federal receivership, which is the way things are supposed to go if the city and the state cannot remedy the situation. And everybody was like, no, not under the Trump administration. Please, no receivership. But you know, what's happening is we're being held in sus suspended animation in regards to these repairs, because if it's no because of a political agenda in Washington, or it's no because uh, the state decided to send more money upstate than downstate, or it's no because, hey, these kids aren't on the lease, but yeah, they live in public housing. You kick them off the lease during the crime, crime bill of uh, 1996 in, uh, you know, in direct uh, contact with the uh, Noriega contraband and crack epidemic of the 1980s. So that, that's, that's what I remember. I was growing up in Red Oak Public Housing in 1980. By 1985-86, out of nowhere, crack invaded the community. The community tried to fight back as best it could, and it did a good job. We also brought in a lot of organizing in the community, like the Red Hook Community Justice Center we started lifting each other up, you know what I'm saying? But unfortunately, there are still policies in place that are very racist and that also uh, do a pendulum swing every time a different administration comes into office. So I'll stop right there and give someone else the floor. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Um, so, you know, I think that there's a, a, a kind of background feature to a lot of these problems and um, it can be summed up in one word and that's profit. And uh, Rob, I was wondering if, uh, if you could kind of dissect these issues from, from the underlying uh, structure of profit for us and uh, you know, other problems that you see with housing as well. So thank you. First, I wanna commend my fellow panelists. Um, I just agree with all of the thoughts that they dropped on the table and there's, you know, there's a relationship in one way or the other. Sierra and I have worked together for years. We know one another. Um, I was obviously from my bio, I was very much involved in the Take Back the Land movement. While I didn't work directly with Liz, one of Liz's neighbors, Catherine Lennon, um, is a house that we liberated um, through the work of Take Back the Land. And you know, in the chat, I put a name. Some people say don't call people's names out, but Ryan Acuff, uh, was a leader in the Take Back the Land local action group up in Rochester and made a lot of stuff happen. So Liz, your story is powerful. Thanks for sharing. Um, and I think we have to share stories like that because that's how we, we, we build, I like to say data, right? So we often think of data as, <clears throat> as surveillance, but data is often used against us. We can use data to make our stories and push forward. So we have to think that way. Karen, <clears throat> Red Hook Initiative stands tall in the face of those cruise ships and overlooking New York Harbor. And I've seen public housing fall all over the country. And I keep saying, yo, how the hell is Red Hook Houses still standing there? <laughs> so the fight has been strong. Props to all of you guys out in Red Hook Houses. It has been a powerful effort out there. And, you know, I know Red Hook Initiative real well. I, I go out there often and talk to the youth um, and collaborate with them. So. Yeah, you know, sometimes it could be daunting and doesn't feel like you're winning, but y'all are doing some dynamite work out there. And obviously, you know, Sierra and I, Sierra is leading the Housing Justice for All movement, which is bringing folks together. So just before I go into the, the economics of this issue, I want to talk, uh, there's some fundamental things because the work that uh, that Housing Justice for All is, is working on and organizing tenants really says there's a, there's a problem in this country. And I think part of it is class, right? Because there's single family homeowners who might say to the renters, go get yours, I got mine. I worked hard, I believed in the American dream. I believe the American dream can be somewhat of a false narrative at this point. Conditions have changed and we have to understand that. 
And then we have to do, I think it was Karen who brought up popular and political education. And we as organizers on the ground have to do a better job of that because how do we get that information out to people so that they stop salivating about that American dream? Home ownership is not going to lead to wealth, in my opinion, and I'll debate this with anybody. I would say for many people, it'll lead to perpetual debt. And I think the biggest problem here is we haven't gone at the core issue. See a mention from the creation of this country and taking land from indigenous folks and poverty. Yeah, so and poverty. Hey, what I need you to do. Poverty was never addressed in this country the way it should be. Right. That's the fundamental problem. Right. Wages don't rise as fast as rents. Right. So renters are always going to be in a in a stuck situation. So we have to look at that. But I think the commodification of land and housing has also led to problems in this country. Right. Uh, what Liz talked about, community land trust is a way to remove land from the market. The market is not going to solve our problems. It's just not going to do it. Right. And there is a certain percentage of people in this country let them deal with the market all they want, right? The one percenters can do that and they can play in the market all they want. But for 99% of us, that's gonna be a challenge, right? And we have to be honest about that and we have to talk openly about that. So how do we, how do we bring more humanity to the way that we live? And I think we have to learn to share. We live in a country where we decide, I'm gonna get mine and I get my families, you go get yours. That's not going to build community, right? And I think that's part of our struggle, whether we're open enough to admit that or not. I think an economic system that preys on us, and I, I was on the subway this morning, and it was a sign for people to get their credit rating up. I'm not a believer in credit rating, but there are some people that do because they want to, they want to buy a home, and I don't want to crush anybody's wishes. But there's a, there's a credit card that they have out now that has an APR rate from anywhere from 12% to 30%. That's going to put you deeper in an effing hole and people don't get it. And we salivate for this and they constantly push these messages out at us and we've absorbed it. If we stop saying we, want, we don't want to borrow money, then the system is going to change. So we have to push back on the system, but understand how it works back to popular and political education. You know, there was a time in this country when you talk about capitalism, socialism, and some of these other isms, people didn't want to hear it. Oh, you're just a communist, get away from me. You know, what are you talking about? You know, and I, I would say that even my own family and I, you know, my, my dad and mom on here to defend themselves, but I grew up in a house that believed in those narratives. Work hard and you're going to get this. They didn't look at some of the obstacles that were put in the way of preventing them from getting ahead, right? And then you come to the situation that Liz was in during the economic downturn. Our president, we all salivated for this guy, Obama, who got elected, mm -hmm. and he took our tax money and bailed out banks and basically sent a message, you know what, Liz, it's okay for you to fail, but Bank of America can't fail. And right. then Bank of America and Citibank and JP Morgan Chase started foreclosing and evicting us in record numbers. Right. So that's how the work of Take Back the Land came about. You can't have the houses in our tax money, too. Just doesn't work that way. So we're going to take back the houses. And I think that's the kind of way we have to rise up in this country. I am a little disenchanted with with society in this country. I thought that was the time. And I, I don't I'm not preaching violence here, folks. Understand what I'm saying. I thought that was the time for revolution. And we sat and we did nothing and 2008. That was the time for us to send a message back at our government. So fast forward to today, um, some of these signs have perpetuated themselves through the pandemic. We see uh, a tidal wave of evictions being prepared and ready to go through the courts. And it makes the work of housing justice for all and some of these other coalitions very strong. Right to counsel, something we won. They're trying to take away from us. So folks are struggling. So I think it, it all comes down to money, right? The wealthy landlords in the 1% are trying to make sure that their lives are stable, but dispose of the other 99% of us. But I think through popular and political education, our voices need to rise up and we need to, to be heard. And sometimes that happens in many ways. We have made our, our voices heard at the ballot box. Um, you're starting to see a wave of change in New York City. We have an all woman city. Well, a majority, let me change that, a majority <laughs> I see, see you laughing, city council. You can see how happy I am. That's a huge change for New York, right? Women 
um, are in the majority in the New York City Council. That's huge. So I, I think there are opportunities here, but we have to be smart and take advantage of those opportunities. As I like to say, the door is ajar. We need to kick it open and make the changes necessary for a better life. So I'm going to stop right there and we can you know, go into part two or however you guys want to proceed. That is a uh, wonderful segue into talking about solutions. How is it that we kick open that door? Um, um, you know, Sia, I would love to hear about uh, some campaigns that Housing Justice for All has done, um, maybe stuff you're working on now, um, just your perspective on, on how to achieve these things. Yeah, totally. Um, a lot of my um, co-panelists have raised some really interesting ideas that I think are solutions here. Um, so to me, the solution to adjust housing market, housing market, I don't want to even use that word, um, adjust house, housing, whatever, ethos. System. <laughs> um, system, there you go. Um, really relies on two things. The first is, you know, housing that is held off of the market in the public sector um, and is invested in in the public sector, is safe, is affordable, is well-maintained, doesn't make us sick, right? Like housing in the public sector that is high quality and affordable permanently. Um, and the second is this issue of, you know, who is making decisions about the housing? People really want to make decisions about where they live, you know? Even if I had the best landlord in the world, if I was completely trapped out of like the dignity that comes with making decisions about, am I going to paint this wall the color that I want it? Am I going to be able to make decisions about, you know, so many things? I mean, even from like when you're, the moment you're a kid and you get your own room, like you want to put up the posters on the wall, you know, like dignity and decision making in our homes is incredibly important. Um, and so this issue of democratic control over our housing control by the people who live in it is really, really meaningful and is really critical to the, the world that we want to live in. So at Housing Justice for All, and, and you know, Karen spoke about that when she talked about resident management corporations, and it's hard work. Like making decisions about your home, it's hard work. But in public housing, in community land trusts, even in you know, home ownership, this sort of like us getting to make decisions about where we lay our head at night is so important emotionally. Um, and for building the political buy-in to have that model sustain over time. A lot of sort of experiments with mass housing haven't worked when the people who live in the housing hate living there, you know? Um, that, that is like so critically important that people feel connected and feel like they can like have a say in the future of what happens where they live. Um, so at Housing Justice for All, we try to pursue um, policy campaigns that address those two lanes. One, public investment in safe housing, and two, tenant power and tenant control. Um, and we try to evaluate the legislation that comes before Albany um, and fight for bills that, you know, work on both of those things. Um, and, I, you know, Liz is on our steering committee at Housing Justice for All. I work really closely with Rob. I don't work as closely with Karen, but I know, Karen, your reputation precedes, precedes you, and I'm inspired by your work. Um, and our top priorities in Albany right now are um, two bills that I want to speak about that really speak to both of these things, expanding public investment and expanding um, tenant control. The first is um, good cause eviction or right to remain. This is like a really straightforward bill that would expand um, more or less the right to a tenancy. So your landlord doesn't decide if you have to, if you get to leave or go um, to 4 million renters in New York state who currently have no protections whatsoever. Um, the right to renew your lease or the right, it's not technically the right to renew your lease because in fact, many tenants don't have leases, but it is, it does say basically that if your landlord wants you to leave from your home where you live, they have to have a good reason to pursue that displacement action. Um, and it says a second thing too, it says that um, a rent increase greater than 150% of the consumer price index is as good as an eviction. Um, so it's really a basic set of tenant protections. But the reason why we think it's like so relevant for this sort of tenant power and this public investment 
is that unregulated renters all over the state, including in New York City, cannot do a very basic thing. They can't set up a tenant organization and they can't get organized without a fear of landlord retaliation and a fear of then like eviction, right? There's so many predatory evictions. There's so many retaliatory evictions. There's so many families who are so afraid to call code that they don't call code so they're living in completely unsafe conditions, um, unsure about what will happen if they try to get the lead paint out of their apartment, if they try to get that leaky mold fixed or whatever, that leaky ceiling fixed, whatever, whatever. So good cause eviction is, our, our, is a bill that we've been fighting for since 2019. It's before the state legislature right now, sponsored by Julia Salazar in the Senate, Assemblywoman Pamela Hunter out of Syracuse in the Assembly. And we are so confident that we can get it done this year. And I'm really thankful to, for the support of a lot of the folks on this call who have really built the campaign for this bill from scratch. Um, the second thing that we're fighting for is tenant opportunity to purchase or a right of first refusal. Um, this is a bill that would um, give tenants who currently live in their homes a right of first refusal when their building is up for sale or foreclosure, and also like a right of first offer. It's a mechanism and it you know, allows a six month to a year process where tenants can seek public financing through either HCR or the, or the local housing agency, make an offer on the building, and convert that building to a limited equity cooperative, so a shared equity co-op, a community land trust, like the one that Liz was describing at City Roots, or if they so choose to convert that building to public housing. Um, the bill says that if the tenants want to become public housing, they can do that. Um, so that's sort of a second bill that we're pursuing that would allow to ha use housing that's currently on the market to be controlled by things like resident management corporations, like, like Karen mentioned. Um, so those are our two priorities as Housing Justice for All in this legislative cycle. We were fighting for some things in the state budget. Um, the state budget is being signed as we speak. It was a total disaster. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can turn some things around and get some things done in the remainder of the legislative cycle. And the last thing I want to say is that the reason why I think these bills are so important um, is that we need to expand the number of people who are organized as renters in order to build more tenant power and in order to change to a new housing system. Right now, public housing tenants are organized as public housing tenants. Rent stabilized tenants are organized as rent stabilized tenants. Unregulated tenants are, are not as organized as they need to be, but we are really getting going and the tenant union in Rochester is like really leading the way on that. Um, we need to find a way for all of these silos and homeless New Yorkers are also organized as homeless New Yorkers. We need to break out of these silos and have a basic set of protections for everyone that can unite us as a housing movement of people who are sort of locked out of the housing system, public housing residents, um, unregulated rent, all, all renters, all renters, homeless New Yorkers fighting together for a system that's, you know, for a new system because the one that we have right now is really not built for us. Um, and so I'm really eager to figure that out, to like raise, raise the floor for all tenants so that we can be fighting together for investment in our public housing, investment in, you know, bringing more housing off of the market and into the public good. Very well put, Sia, thank you. Karen, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Yes, I do. I mean, that all sounds great, and but I, I just have to remind Sia that public housing, affordable housing, rent stabilized, rent control housing are all different programs. And public housing is a beast unto itself. And while you raise the issue that public housing has resident councils, it only took me 35 years to get elected. We had the same president for 40 years, okay? So that's nonsense. And I believe, and I'm going to be provocative enough to say this, elected officials know what's going on in those residents' council is really a part of the veil pen, is really a part of keeping us from getting the information that we need to take the next step in self-sufficiency. And because a lot of times they come in and they look at us for a voting block. Instead of looking at, at us as human beings, intelligent enough to vote for those who look out for us. 
That we won't be doing anymore. And I'm putting everybody on notice today. We will not be voting in people who continue to do gaslighting with public housing residents. I do not share the stage with other um, work like uh, Housing Justice for All, unfortunately, because we weren't on their radar. And when it comes to public housing, public housing residents have to be the ones who speak. So I'm gonna say the reason why I created the Public Housing Civic Association was because things aren't working for public housing residents. Now, we also are a sanctuary city and I'm very grateful for New York City stepping up to the plate for that, but that doesn't uh, uh, mitigate the fact that I've been living in public housing for 40 years, paying over $100,000 out of my own pocket in rent and I have no equity. When y'all talking about homes, I'm talking about holding on to a 400 square foot apartment because I paid a 30 year mortgage living in that same apartment for over 30 years. And I don't believe that we should start this compromised conversation around what I'm talking about and what you're talking about, Sia, and I'm not trying to be funny or nothing, but I'm not talking politics here. I'm talking fix our homes, period, period, period. And I want equity in my little 400 foot or whatever it is apartment because I've been in there since 1989 and nobody upgraded an electric wire, a riser, took asbestos, let, they damn near try to kill me in there. That belongs to me. And if you really know the law, if it's proven, then you really don't have to uh, pay to be there. I'm, I'm gonna stop there and I don't mean to be confrontational, but I don't want nobody coming in Red Hook thinking that because we're organized now, you're just gonna come out there and start gaslighting my community because we are organized and we will not be standing for that. That's not right. Public housing needs to get fixed first before we keep on going, this person, that person, next thing, next thing, next thing. You're already talking about converting um, um, apartments through HCR. HCR has ignored public housing residents and so has DASNY. Where's our money? Where's our money from the state? So if I'm up there begging for public housing and you begging for somebody else, we need to sit down and talk and come to a real consensus on how we're gonna both get some of this money. Cause right now y'all gaslighting us and I don't like it. Okay, I think, um, you know, an interesting uh, pathway that's outside of electoral politics is the the creation of of uh, community land trusts. You know, we've mentioned them a couple times in this conversation so far. Um, Liz, I was wondering if you could describe the structure of your community land trust uh, as a way of of illuminating what community land trusts are. Um, well, community land trusts, um, they're they're kind of they're built in this way so the land is held. Um, by the community for 90 years. And um, in the, the, um, the home is always affordable. Um, it remains affordable for the next generation. And how that affordability happens is um, people can, you know, you can pass it down to your, your, your children. It's kind of, and you, you build equity in your home but it's not, you know, there's equity that's built in your home. Um, like if I go to sell my home, I would pay, you know, up to 25%. Well, I would, well, let me take this back for a second. The amount of money that I would get for selling my home, I could only sell it at a 25%, a you know, advance. So that's, you know, if you look at any house on the market, it goes up. Like, for example, um, if I bought my house for 20,000 and um, now it goes in a, in a year or so, or, you know, a 10 year period, it goes up to 40 or 50,000. The amount of equity that I can um, sell it for is like 25% of what it was originally, what I originally brought it for. So you get an opportunity to build some equity, but it's not, 
to the point where it's like the market, the market will um, sell the house if it's 25% I, and then it goes up to 40%, they can sell it even higher than that. Or they can, you know, if they basically they can make it whatever out of the price range, whatever the price of the market is at that time. Um, like originally when my house, when I bought my house, it was at 55,000. Now it's at 90,000. So when, when I go to sell my house, I will sell it at a, a, a price that's going to be like um, a percentage, 25% above of what the original cost that I, that, I, um, that I sold it, that I bought it for. So that cost is kind of um, moved on to the next person that buys it. So they buy it at a lower cost. It's not at the market rate cost, but it's at a lower cost. So it's passing that savings on to the next homeowner. Um, and the, um, the good thing about it too is like um, we have like one of the things we were able to do was get a community garden. So we have a community garden, our, our land trust. We have like um, an encampment, homeless encampment within the land trust. Um, where, um, you know, people have some place to go, you know, when they're, they are homeless, if they choose not to go into like a, a, a shelter setting. Mm -hmm. So we have this opportunity to build a different kind of, um, a different kind of model mm -hmm. to allow, you know, for a different type of, um, of housing. There's, there's, there's the Champaign um, Community Land Trust. There's, um, there's the Albany Community Land Trust, and these are successful because people have an opportunity to say what happens in their community, they have an opportunity to say so um, of what type of what type of things they want in their community. It gives the community an opportunity to speak in their voices to be heard, um, unlike the real estate industry where it's um, you know you know based on a market. And one of the other things that um, that happens, it's part of the community land trust has a board. Um, it has um, three public representatives, tenants that live on the land, resident, we call them resident um, owners, and um, community members um, that, you know, they may not live, they may live in the area, they may live someplace else, but they, they all kind of help you know, with the, um, the formation and the uh, bylaws and all that and the policy. And, and so we do have a, a board of a director and he's kind of, you know, kind of um, his, the work that he does, the, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. We have like a, a CEO and um, basically the board kind of tells the CEO what we want, what we want to see, what we want to see, how we want to see growth. So it's it's an opportunity that gives the community um, a chance to say what they want to see in their in their community. So that's kind of the um, that's a little bit of the structure of how it's set up. Um, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I was wondering if you could go back to the the homeless encampment that's part of your uh, CLT. Um, I'm curious how that works. I imagine in Rochester, it's like most parts of the country, homeless encampments are probably illegal in, in some way. Um, is it uh, legal because it's on your private property or on you know the private property of the CLT? It's, uh, um, it was one of the things that um, when the community land trust was first started, it was one of the things we had a, um, a homeless encampment um, that was kind of, um, kind of pushed around, you know, if the city didn't like it, they, they would take a bulldozer and bulldoze pretty much everybody else's stuff. Um, this one encampment was in one area. They were there for like two years. And so what we did was we were able to get a bunch of lawyers to represent them because they, that was their residence and they had to be evicted in order for them to move them. So, um, so the city of Rochester, um, a bunch of organizations, like I said before, came together to support and we provided food, we provided, you know, so that they could remain in their, 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 their space that they had created because they had been there for so long, for such a long period of time. 
And so the city um, decided, you know, um, we don't want this here. We got to get it. We have to move it. And it was kind of strategic because the place where they were, it wasn't run by the city. It was actually run by the state. And they were under a bridge. <laughs> so it was the, the state had um, control over it. So the city negotiated um, with the tenants. They sat down with them and said, you know, you know, um, we want you to move. And the tenants said, well, we need a place to move to. And so the city, you know, compromised and they said, well, we have this spot. The tenants went and looked at three different spots in the city. And then they chose the spot that they wanted to go to, which was centrally located and close to a, um, a home, um, a couple of shelters. So if they needed to um, have um, a shower, there was a place for them to do that. So um, that's how that came came about with the, the CLT. And so the CLT, the city actually gave the land to the CLT for that to happen. Um, and the tenants have been there, you know, so it's been there, um, I would say almost two years now, two to three years, it's been about three years. So cool, very cool. Um, Rob, I was uh, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about your uh, experience with homelessness, uh, if that's okay with you, and how yeah, it specifically led to your critical perspective of housing. Yeah, so um, for folks who don't know, I've spent two and a half years on the streets of Miami and 10 months in a New York City homeless shelter. And I used the, form, I used the term transformation. It transformed the way I think about our society, um, how we live, how we relate to one another, the humanity involved in our work. And I think this conversation has is, is piqued my interest again because I can see that we are, we are a society that works out of silos, but that experience for me gave me the lived experience and to be able to connect that as an African-American growing up in a household on Long Island that my dad purchased in the early 60s, purchased a house for $22,500. But I, I keep hearing the term equity in this conversation. And I wonder how much we're enamored by that word, but it really is meaningless. And I'll explain what that means down the road. Um, I watch my family. Well, as I recall history, I understand it that my family went to purchase this house out in Freeport, Long Island, a seaside community, and discrimination reared its early head because when my family traveled from Brooklyn to Long Island and the real estate person saw them, he told them upon arrival that somebody had left a deposit on the house, right? So um, he thinks they're going to buy it. So he kind of turned my parents away. About two weeks later, the same ad is in the paper for the same house. My dad sent his white worker comrade down to inquire about the house and the real estate uh, investor took, uh, the real estate uh, person took him to the house, showed him the house and asked him if he was interested because there's a few people inquiring, would he like to leave a deposit? So you basically caught him, you know, you had him trapped, right? My parents end up getting this house and make a long story short. But growing up as a kid, my dad worked in the restaurant business, eventually became an owner, but he worked as a chef in the early part of my life. I didn't see my dad as a kid because he was working 16 to 18 hours a day because now, as I understand it, he got a predatory loan, right? Mm -hmm. And trying to pay off the mortgage. I can remember my dad stressed constantly about the mortgage, the mortgage. It was a topic of conversation at the dinner table on a continual basis. So as I went through this transformation and having parents that believed in the American dream, my father going to his grave would tell you, you work hard, you'll get everything you want. My father worked hard and ended up with nothing, right? And I learned from that, right? So my brother is now living in the house that uh, I grew up in, paid for a mortgage, fully paid for. But on Long Island, if anybody is familiar with it, the taxes, most of the taxes go to the school district. My brother lives in a house that we grew up in that the taxes every year are $11,500 a year. My brother is 63 years of age. His partner is 55. Who goes to school in that house? There's no kids in the house. Why are you paying all those taxes? Because he bought into the American dream. Now the house is about 70 years old. 
starts to need repairs, a new roof, $50,000, new siding, $50,000. Did you prepare for this when you decided that you wanted to buy a house? Or did you get caught up in the moment saying, this is a great idea. I bought into the American dream. I got a house. It's going to build wealth. I, I would argue that it might have provided some security for people, but this idea of, of equity and wealth is a myth. And here's how I attribute that. We went through the financial crisis. Liz articulated her experience, right? And we saw in the foreclosure crisis how quickly that equity can be snatched away from you because the banks are not going to lose. What do I mean by that? Hypothetical, you bought a house prior to the financial crisis. That house was selling for $500,000. You go to the bank, you get a 30-year mortgage, everything is done by 2005. You start paying off your monthly mortgage, whatever the number is. Here comes the economic downturn of 2008. All of a sudden, that house value drops to $300,000. Greedy bank still wants to mortgage on $500,000, right? And then until we started organizing ourselves and pushing back and the government got involved, oh, you know what? Let's offer these folks some principal reduction. Let's actually reduce the, the principal in the house to the actual value of the house, right? And we organized all over the country for principal reduction and it happened, right? But I would argue that a bank can create a financial crisis anytime it wants. And I learned that from a Marxist theorist at the CUNY Grad Center in two simple terms. David Harvey made me understand what use value and exchange value means. A house has a use value to you and me and our families as a place to live in. It has a use value to the financial institution that holds the note and usually controls the value of that house. It has an exchange value to you as a family where we think we are building equity, right? But the financial institution who holds the note really controls the equity and the exchange value in that house. They control both sides of that equation, but we're led to believe that we're gonna build some kind of equity. Now, if you have a lot of money and you can buy multiple houses and flip them, you can build some wealth but that's probably the only way you're gonna do it or you're gonna have it passed down. So I, 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 I argue with this issue of, of equity and, and the wealth that we're gonna extract from a home. I do think, and I think that sort of bridges and I wanna bridge a, a conversation between Liz, they didn't conversate directly in Karen, but things I heard from both of them. So as somebody who's formerly homeless, I lived on the streets for two and a half years and I. My time on the streets was in Miami under the hot sun. That sun wore my ass out. And I knew I was not going to survive that sun staying there. And I had to get back to New York somehow. But I'm now caught in a situation where folks are fighting for, oh, for 10 cities, like Liz explained. And in New York, there's a Stop the Sweeps campaign. I understand the foundation of why you want to do that, because people have rights. But I'm kind of conflicted as somebody who organizes with a human right to a home that says, as somebody articulated earlier, that everybody needs an affordable, decent place to live, right? I think those two things are mutually exclusive, right? So I get charged by the community a lot. How come you can't support us stop the sweeps? Well, I have that lived experience. I don't want to live on the street. And I don't think it makes sense. People are going to die on the streets if they try to live through these elements. So I think we, what we have to do, and, and it's part of this conversation, is find a way for homeowners, renters, homeless folks to all collaborate. I did see this at one point, and I think Sia knows who I'm talking about, the folks in the Chicago anti-eviction campaign during the core work of Take Back the Land were able to bring all of those folks together into a space to have conversations and, and to build community around it. So, I think we have to find a way, right? Everybody has different means. Everybody's at a different financial situation. The housing is gonna look different, right? And we have to accept that. But I do think that everybody needs an affordable, clean, safe, and dignified place to live. And that's what international human rights law does. And I put the Universal Declaration of Human Rights article number 25 in the chat. And it's just very clearly. So it's not something I learned in school. It's something we need to challenge our government about. What is our, gov what is our obligation of our government to ensure those rights? And I think that's where it starts. And it leads into some of that conversation that Karen was talking about. But I'll also say this, 
Karen, Liz, and Sia, the National Alliance of HUD Tenants has done a good job in the past of reclaiming properties that were subsidized by the federal government and given tenant control. And those buildings are succeeding. So there are models out there. What we need to do a better job is, is learning from one another, sharing knowledge, right? Um, we, we're not good at that. And we have to be open about that. And we have to create the space to have these conversations. And even when those conversations are difficult, we all have to come together and put it on the table. And I'm so proud to say, chop it up until we come to consensus. Well said, Rob, thank you. Um, Sia, I wanted to circle back to you and um, uh, I'd like to know how you imagine um, all of these disparate groups that you, that you mentioned, uh, you know, um, the rent stabilized folks, uh, public housing folks, homeless folks, um, et cetera. Um, what is your vision for bringing everyone together in solidarity and working as uh, one class of people who, you know, essentially don't own property. Yeah, I mean, I think it's not easy to do, right? I think some of the some of the things that Rob mentioned speak exactly to the challenges, and, and Karen and Liz as well, right? Like everyone has their own identities and backgrounds that they're bringing to the table, and not everyone is starting at the same place, and you know it makes the organizing that we're doing hard. Um, I will tell you what has worked for us in Housing Justice for All in the past, and it's very straightforward. <laughs> it's not magic or rocket science. It's bringing people together in a room to share their experiences, to learn from one another, to talk about where our experience aligned, where are we different, and how can we help each other be more powerful together and more than the sum of our parts. Um, the founding assembly of Housing Justice for All we did in Albany and we had tenant groups from all over the state coming together. Um, and they were, you know, groups organizing with homeless New Yorkers, rent stabilized tenants and unregulated renters. And we talked about what are people going through where they're living? Um, what kinds of like tactics and strategies have you pursued to win things in the past? Because I think that's really important. Um, different types of organizing groups use different types of direct action to win the things that they want to do, different types of like, I don't know, theories of change to win the things that they want to win. And we can learn a lot from each other because we need like a multitude of strategies and a multitude of tactics and a multitude of organizing everywhere in order to win. Um, I don't necessarily think that there's going to be like one um, one answer and one solution and everything is gonna be like completely organized. It takes a movement, not, not simply one organization in order to shift the balance of power in this state. Um, and, you know, I, I, I tend to think that like when one person is like in charge of a movement or one organization is in charge of a movement, it's way too easy for the powers that be to buy that organization off <laughs> and undermine everybody else, you know? Um, so what, what I would say what we need to do is we need to make a couple of structural changes, like, you know, real estate money out of politics is one, more basic rights for everybody to raise the floor for everyone is another. Um, and we need to get, have tenant assemblies, get people in a room and to learn from our experiences the way that we're doing right now. Um, a second thing is just like people are too disengaged, right? Um, too many people don't feel like tenant organizing will work no matter where they live. They're, people are too disempowered. And so like the power of bringing people together to actually win shit is really important. Reaching out to people who actually don't believe in housing justice because not because they don't want it, but because they've never experienced it or seen it and have never experienced that organizing could actually work. We need, to we need to prove to people that it's worth their time to come to the community meeting. Cause honestly, like some, a lot of people are tired and they've, there's like, I went to the community board meeting. I went to the tenant association meeting, nothing changed. And that apathy is um, a huge, huge barrier to organizing as a class of people. And, you know, the only way we overcome it is by winning. So there's no, there's the only way out is through. 
Thank you for that. Um, you mentioned something uh, that I think is really interesting in there, which is uh, if one person or one organization is leading the charge of this movement, um, it runs the risk of being bought off. And um, I think it's there's an interesting kind of tension between grassroots organizing and uh, institutions such as nonprofits and especially philanthropic institutions in this conversation. And I kind of just wanted to open the floor and see uh, what is what are people's opinions on the role of philanthropy in Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Let's hear it, Rob. Um, it's a hot button topic for me. And I want to preface this and folks and listen to my words carefully. I am blessed and privileged to be able to work in the social justice world without depending on a salary from an organization. Not every organizer has that kind of blessing. Very few people have that type of blessing, right? So it allows me to offer constructive criticism. And I also have been in a place where I've worked quite a bit internationally and seen organizing done differently and without the influence of philanthropy. So I've seen that it can happen. I think we stand sometimes on a phrase that I'm challenged with. You gotta meet people where they're at is a famous phrase of on the ground organizing here in, in the US. And I would argue that people are all over the fucking place. How are you going to get anything done? But when I go to Brazil, um, where they have a what they call formation, form a sal, right? We bring everybody to a political place, and then we move together in formation. It's a lot different. We all have a common goal. And I think that's why movements outside of the U.S., particularly in Brazil, can work together. So you'll see the landless workers movement working very closely with the movement of people affected by dams in Brazil, because they went through this formation exercise and their political objectives and their social objectives are all aligned. So, but I think what happens here is, and I, again, I wanna be very clear. I understand why not-for-profit organizations take philanthropic dollars, but I do think that those philanthropic dollars sometimes dictates the work. It's not necessarily, the work to make sure we push back on RAD, it's uh, some other type of work or money that came into, uh, into Red Hook Brooklyn to do some other work, but maybe, and, I, and I'm not accusing Red Hook Initiative of anything, but it's one of the social justice groups that I know from Red Hook. They took the check because they have a staff that they got to pay. They got bills they got to pay, and I get that. But I think we have to find a way um, we have to find a way to do our organizing different because I do think philanthropic dollars in, 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 infects our work and it infects our work to the degree that some of the things that have surfaced in this conversation happen and we have to figure out ways around it. For me, I've come from my work history was only in the for-profit world. So if I'm going to do this work for social change, I'm not doing it for money. If I need a job, I'll go back to the for-profit world and make a salary and I'll do this at night like I've seen many people in the Philippines or Brazil or Spain do the work. Um, and I think a great example of that will be here this coming week. Um, some of folks may know there's a group from Spain called the Platform of People Affected by Mortgages in Spain. The PA will be in New York next Monday and they'll be here for a week. And I think you know, there's lessons to be learned from that group. So I think one of the things, and, you know, we've mentioned this already, is sharing knowledge, right? And I try to do that in a very uh, visual way. I keep a lanyard around my neck and there are plenty of uh, thumb drives on it. And people always ask me for information. And I say, it does, no, it does nobody any good if it's inside of Rob's head, right? We, we are open source and we always use this to take back the land. We're open source. You know, give me an email address and I'll send it to you, right? You know, so it's one of the reasons why I keep these around just as a little reminder and to forge a conversation. I want people to ask me, why do you have all those thumb drives around yet? Because somebody might want some knowledge that I have and I'm more than happy to share it, right? So I think society has to change a little bit too. And that's all of us, right? We have to be open-minded. And I think with sometimes, and I've had this debate 
David Harvey and I had a wicked debate about uh, six months ago about how much we're complicit in our own problems, right? Because our salvation for things and material things, and we create sometimes our own problems and we don't look past that. So I'll stop. I, I feel myself getting a little preachy and I, that's not where I wanted to go. <laughs> so. Thank you, Rob. Karen? Yeah, so I'll continue. So my, my thing about nonprofits is um, number one, there are some good nonprofits. And when, when you think about nonprofits, they were basically non-existent uh, 20, 30 years ago. So there is a spectrum and a learning curve to it. Uh, the thing that makes it work for us in, in Red Hook and Gowanus, because I'm not only in Red Hook, but I actually help fund the Gowanus Neighborhood Coalition for Justice that not only received $217 million for their local public housing, to get uh, plumbing, chase walls, uh, electric panels, a comprehensive modernization. Um, but our second demand was around sewage uh, because you, if you don't have good infrastructure uh, to deliver services and, and um, a, a civilized way of getting rid of waste, then uh, it's for nothing. And then finally, a task force where we made a point of agreement uh, with the city of New York, and we're literally hiring a facilitator to look over this long process because a rezoning takes quite a few years. So what I wanted to say to Rob was, the thing missing with nonprofits is um, nobody goes back and checks them with an IRB. So. One of the things we're doing with Public Housing Civic is the first thing I did through my mentor, Dr. Beverly Watkins, was I took an IRB. I wanted to know, and even being a vulnerable population myself, when you read it, it really hits you. Yeah, I'm a vulnerable population. So somebody could come in and it may be a week where people are low on food, and you come out with a sandwich and the next thing you know, they're following you to Albany or to Washington, but they really don't get what, you're, what they're going for. They're just grateful for the um, allyship and the help. So one of the things we're doing in Red Hook or we do in Red Hook, we have social cohesion across our uh, different nonprofits. So if you go to Red Hook Initiative and you wanna talk about environmental, they know there who the people in the community is that have the expertise around environmental. Um, that might be Re Resilient Red Hook. It may be people from Pioneer Works and it might even be Karen, right? So once you start forming that social cohesion, now you can talk about actually creating a community review board that doesn't allow people to just come in your neighborhood because even institutions do it. Institutions run on research and then they get funding. And the next thing you know, somebody has a great idea like Zipcar, you know, I'm just putting that out there like that. But I, what I'm saying is we have, we got tired of people coming out, stealing our poor. What happened to y'all? Oh, you got lead, you got mold. Can you tell us your story? Can we do a documentary? And at the end of the day, those people go on with their careers, with their research, and they don't even ask us to be a part of the grant. So we're stopping all of that because that is a penetration. That's, a, that's what I meant by when I say gaslighting. That's some of the things that I'm talking about when I talk about how society keeps a, neck, a foot on public housing's neck. Public housing is not cheap in New York City, okay? Public housing is the thread that holds New York City together. And I keep telling people, you played the same compromise of 1877 if you want. I don't think New York City is ready for a reverse migration or to turn red. So be careful because it's don't put, I don't like politics in front of people. And I don't want anybody coming out saying they're there to help me get an apartment or to, to stabilize my housing at the cost of I can't listen or talk to another politician or another way of thinking. We deserve the right to orientate ourselves and give ourselves political education. So again, 
These are the reasons why, not that I'm trying to stop people from being one party or the other. I just don't think it's fair that we keep getting skewed like a blade of grass. And it's always on my back that I have to carry the additional weight. We want public housing fixed and we feel we deserve it and we demand it in South Brooklyn, not just Red Hook, Kiwanis and White Corps. We want to be the model for the rest of the city on how you should be treating public housing. And we're putting localism into effect. So we're talking to our local civic associations, whether that's Park Slope Civic. Um, we're bringing in all of these different team members and people to tell our story, to take them on tours, to tell them what the challenges are around space. We don't even have community space to meet. Many developments, the first thing they do when they want to get rid of a development or dis disorientate you is not have a place for people to, to meet. There are, there are uh, uh, community centers like the one in Gowanus that's been closed for a whole generation. We, that's, not, that's not fair, that's not equitable. How do these people get to decide their future when they're being veal pen? You know what a veal pen is, right? In case you don't know, it's where they put a baby uh, 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 lamb in this small 24 inch box because they don't want him to move one muscle you know, because they want to be nice and tender for slaughter. We have to kick open the veal pen that is public housing. Now in the past, maybe not these generations see her, but looking back, I'm almost 60 years old. I think there were times I remember when there were controversies around politicians going to the churches telling them, don't talk about voting today. So yeah, look it up right here in New York City. So if they were doing that with the churches, what do you think they're doing in public housing? That is not democratic to have people come in our community and just talk their agenda while not doing anything for us. And so we started doing something for ourselves. We even have community members because Red Hook is an industrial area that after Hurricane Sandy was willing to come in and help us get rid of mold and all of these different things. And the answer was no, but we're gonna keep pressing until we create a real public-private partnership through Public Housing and Civic Association. So folks, if I could just jump in a, a quick response. One, Karen, I think I put my contact information in the chat. We should have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, as, they, as Derek led off, I'm teaching a class at the new school and we gave them five projects to work on uh, starting off and two of the students taking it and they're running with it as the thesis. And one of those projects was the Gowanus rezoning and the so-called racial impact study that was done there. They picked it apart, called it weak, and we got in debate with the creators of that report, but those students are working through it and that's what their thesis is gonna be on. Um, there's a problem with some of these places also. The city wants to rezone it. All the affordable housing is gonna be right next to that canal which is, a, which is already a super fun site. And the federal government said, we can't clean it up for 25 years. So you're gonna put poor, poor, low-income people of color right next to that carcinogen affected canal, right? So you're repeating processes that have continued constantly. And we need to have a discussion about that. But there are, you know, there are well-intentioned folks and my students did that through a participatory research project involving the community. They leave. I remember that study. I definitely yeah. remember that study, yeah. but like I have an engineering background. And so when I look globally at climate change and we, we really look at what areas are gonna be habitable going into the next 30, 40 years, um, a great, majority of the population will not be within those safe zones. So mm -hmm. when my mind, I have to think about the land that we do have. And yes, it is tox toxins there, but there are levels to cleanups. And so if it was going to stay industrial, they would not have to clean it up to the same uh, uh, degree that they would have to clean Agreed. it up. So that's for me, this rezoning was already in play for, it's been talked about and done for over 10 years. Our thing was to get in and get something for the community. 
something that they could live with. I was even trying to get, you know, there was one time there was talk about this uh, public, public value recovery or air transfer right from the public housing to those areas. And my thing is, I wouldn't even do that without going to talk to the homeowners. So you, when, you, when you're a leader and you're, you're a leader in communities like New York City, you have to be a leader for everyone. You can't go down the line and say, oh, public housing don't know a lot. So I'm gonna just let them think I'm leading them. And then I'm gonna use them for a bargaining tool at the table. You know what I'm saying? We need to be in that room so we can watch our states and our territory at that table because nobody's watching it. Well, Nobody. I will say this, Karen, my, just a quick direct response. I don't think anybody that I know with that is making an attempt to organize folks in Gowanus are doing it that way. They want to bring people to the table to have a conversation. We don't want to speak for people. I know I don't. That's not my intention. I don't speak for homeless people, right? I'm not trying to do that, but I understand the issue because I lived it, right? So I can support those people and give them the capacity and make and sort of create spaces for them to have the conversations that are necessary. And I think that's the goal of, of well-intentioned organizers. But I just put my uh, my information in the chat. Yeah. I mean, uh, I still think we did a really amazing job with the Gowanus Neighborhood Coalition for Justice okay. to see that diversity of people, affluency, come together and all say that they wanted public housing fixed, irregardless of whether rezoning goes through or not. They want their I agree. It was your group that took my students on the tour. So I, you know, yeah. I, yeah. I know all about it, but you know, Thank now you. we're connected directly and we can figure out okay. how to move forward together. Thank you. And the same for Sia. I would love to have a one-on-one -on -one with you. And right. I at um, this time, oh, sorry, go ahead. I would I also like to have a one-on-one. -on -one. We've been organizing tenants in um that are living in high rises and um We've been organizing them um, and trying to, um, you know, for some reason it's hard because they're not, they're very divided and the, the, the landlord kind of divides them and pits them against each other. And that's kind of always been an, a struggle with um, trying to organize in, in, in those buildings. Um, so yeah, I would love to, to, to have an opportunity to talk to you. Um, Um, at this time, uh, I'm going to talk after the panel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can just keep the Thanks room for open for you out. guys. <laughs> Happy to. Um, at this time, we, uh, we're going into audience Q&A. Um, no questions have been put in the chat so far. Uh, so I want to once again invite people to uh, add questions to the chat. Or if you want to just unmute and ask your question, um, please feel free. Um, I guess in the meantime, uh, Liz, one, or I'm sorry, Karen, one question I wanted to ask you uh, is how do you think those partnerships between public housing uh, tenants and, and organizers and other organizers, uh, how do you think those can work better? What's missing? Authenticity authenticity. Um, I know you, Rob said, I throw that word equity around a lot, but you have to be, you, ha you really have to do an accounting first. So numbers were important. We had to make sure that public housing, number one, felt safe and supported in numbers inside of the coalition. So anybody from public housing who wanted to be a part of the coalition was able to join and be a voting member. When it came to organizations, we limited the amount of people who could vote for an organization. And we also had to vet you. Uh, you had to, we had bylaws, you know, you had to show up for meetings. You, and, and so one of the things I think that really sets Red Hook apart is a blessing from God, really. Robin Moses cut us off so many years ago and what he meant for bad, God turned to good because we've been isolated for so long. I've been in Red Hook since I was 19 years old. I'm 59 this year. I was afraid of Red Hook. I was scared to be there. I was also a fighter, you know? 
And so when those things combine and when you're in a community and you, you grow to love the community that you're in, the people who love public housing are the people who live in public housing. Um, I've, they've asked elderly people, why are you paying $2,000 a month and living in public housing? Because that's their familiarity, that's their community. And yet and still, even through our resiliency processes around um, uh, climate change, We've seen during the pandemic where they came in Red Hook because construction was still an essential work. They tore every single courtyard out. They cut down 457 trees and they took the benches and put them inside the construction zone. So I, I've been talking about what effect that has on our community. And at first I was talking about the effect that it had on the elderly because the elderly used to be able to come outside and sit under the, the coolness of a tree and hear children laughter in a little uh, watering station. And now we have none of that. And we have not had that for several years. When you do these big construction and retrofits for buildings for neighborhoods, it takes a long time and it's disruptive. But then what about the young people during the pandemic who've been inside during construction trying to do homework? You know, what about our young men? What about the fact that public housing, the rates of vaccine is only at 52% based on our history in the United States as black people who went through the Tuskegee experiment, who went through all kinds of other things um, medically where we're too afraid. And that, I think that is one of the biggest things, uh, challenges I have is the fear of the unknown in public housing. I don't have the answer, but I can put together a team with my vision that will create something better than what we have now. But people can be so frightened of change that they're immobilized. We have to mobilize people and we have to mobilize our youth. And that calls for vocational training. That calls for section three, which is a HUD mandate to really be enforced in New York City where these young people are given jobs and they, they, they're using their hands and their brains. The next cure for cancer or a pandemic or coronavirus could come out the projects. Is that scary for anyone? Or is that what we want? We want that, you know, we're losing another generation and we really need to get people activated almost like uh, back in the New Deal time but this time could you include black people in it, you know, because during the New Deal, black people couldn't work. Um, but if we were able to really galvanize people together around trans, uh, uh, renewable energy, around climate change, around coming up with uh, new designs for uh, open space and for homelessness, even if we only, uh, progress 10%, it would be an increase for all. So yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, any questions from our audience? Or Jonathan? Yeah, I was uh, meaning to put in. Um, I'm interested in asking everyone this kind of like um, throwing this out there. It seems to me there's an interesting maybe tension, but more so just disagreement occasionally between certain wings of the housing justice movement where you have on the one hand, um, eviction defense, uh, you have kind of more direct action uh, type interventions. Um, and then on the other hand, you have kind of more sort of legislative uh, approaches to these problems where you attempt to you know, fix the situation through the law, through policy. So to sort of bounce off of Derek's earlier question about kind of the role of nonprofits in this movement, I'm interested in seeing how everyone on the panel kind of navigates that um, those two and what they think the kind of uh, ideal combination of the more direct tactics with the legislative systemic um, tactics would look like. I can start it. So in Red Hook, one of the things we did back in the 90s was a 197A plan. And I'm truly a believer, just like uh, I met a gentleman, I think his name was Tony from uh, Staten Island. 
And that's where the city had brought back the land after Hurricane Sandy. And he literally told us how that worked. How did he get that to happen? And I was fascinated. So one of the things I want to say is that uh, politicians are like judges. Judges know how to apply the law. But they don't necessarily know every nuance of each law. It is up to the attorneys in the pit to present their case. We as communities need to start presenting our case. Don't go and say, could we, or I want to talk about, how about taking, we could have took the last two years during the pandemic and had working groups on Zoom, which we did in Red Hook, and came up with a community plan of action, a long-term plan, short-term plan, long-term win, short-term wins. You know what I'm saying? We have to just be more committed to putting in the time because when we put in the time now, it'll save us a lot of time later on. And so uh, that's the commitment we have in Red Hook where we, we uh, support each other. If they know that my tenant meeting is gonna be on a Tuesday, the second Tuesday of the month, then our organ acad organizing academy for our young people may be on the Monday night so that we can encourage them at that meeting to come to the resident council meeting, you know? And then once we start doing that, we'll start looking at the uh, human capacity and assets to see who fits. I might not fit in every meeting. I, might, I, I may have some kind of post-traumatic stress that really stops me from being in a police meeting. I'm just using that as an example. That's not true, but just saying. We need to have community members and enough of a team so that all the weight is not on one shoulder. The weight has to, a good leader distributes the weight throughout so that we all care, carry the burden and we all carry the victory. So that's what we're doing in Red Hook. We're delegating, we're organizing, we're educating, and we're stepping forward just so people know, if I can step forward, you can step forward. And that's it. I think one of the things we think about, and I'm, I'm really curious for Liz and Rob's thoughts on this too, um, is like, how are we turning the types of, so like these eviction defense actions, right? Like by the time, we're doing an eviction defense. In a lot of ways, a lot of harm has already had to occur. By the time you have a community coming together to block the marshals from coming to the house, which is a beautiful and powerful thing, that family has already been to housing court multiple times. Um, they've been going through the time of being behind on rent. A judge has ruled against their case, right? Like a lot of things have already gone wrong by the time the eviction defense happens. Um, and so I think we have to figure out how we hold that tension, right? Like in my ideal world, we're not doing any fucking eviction defense because no one is going through everything that had to go wrong to get up to that point. Um, so we try really hard not to um, romanticize the direct action that is a confrontation because that's not actually like the world that people want is that confrontation. Sometimes we need to do those actions to like stop people from losing their homes. Um, but we don't want to. <laughs> like that's like what we want is for people to not go to court in the first place. Liz didn't want to have to go through a multi-year process fighting the bank just to stay in the home that was hers to begin with, you know? And so I think we have to like figure out both how we like inspire people to participate in the fight and, and um, you know, make sure we know that the fight is worthwhile while also not romanticizing this, this moment too much. And I think Rob spoke about this also when he was talking about like the sweeps, right? Um, and what's happening with the sweeps. So I think this is like a tension that a lot of organizers hold, right? We're like, on the one hand, willing to do what it takes to win. Um, and on the other hand, um, yeah, I don't know. I think that's it. I guess it's also, and the last thing I was going to say is it's not necessarily like scalable to, we can't blockade every single house. Um, and so we just need to, um, 
be really thoughtful about what we're doing and where and follow the lead of, you know, folks who are participating in the eviction defense too. I mean, it's traumatic for the family to go through that process. Right. right. Most people don't want to do it. Most people will be like, I think I'd rather just find a new place to live. Yeah. I I I I, I totally agree with with um Sia. It's just it's it's it depends on the person and how much they want to fight. We never we say these are the things that we can do. And so it's always, always up to that person and what they want to do. Um, we help support and we have community behind them in whatever decision they make. Um, so in my particular case, I was walked through the process. I was told, you know, what could happen. And then I was, I, t I made a decision. I didn't want to just stand back and let this happen to me. Maybe if I stand up, it'll help somebody else. But in me, I could not, I didn't want to just back away because this is, this is, this is what I fought for. And if I backed away, what example would I be leaving for my children? That it's okay just to walk away when somebody says you have to go. And because the bank says, you know, I have these papers on you, so you got to go. I own, I own this rather than me. So for me, it was a decision that I had to make for myself and for my children. And my children went through it just as much as I did. And we talked about it prior to actually me going through this. And we talked about the steps. We talked about what could happen. So it wasn't just me. My family also went through it with me. Um, they, stayed, they came up. They, they stood behind me. They stood at the rallies with me. So that was the thing that kind of um, made it so real for me because I had community behind me. And it wasn't just me standing there. It was a community standing there with me. Could I ask a quick question? Because I don't know a lot about mortgages or anything, but, and maybe somebody can answer this, but like if, if a bank forecloses on you, right? and then they sell the house later on, shouldn't you be getting the difference? Because I saw a program, I saw something where it said a lot of people aren't getting, like, you know, after the foreclosure, the owner could still get a substantial amount of money based on what the bank, how the bank disposed of the property. Right. So. I'm only asking that because I'm always looking for a solution for people in the future. I'm sorry that you went through that because that would have been horrible mentally and emotionally to constantly feel like somebody's going to put you out of your home, especially like during a snowstorm in the middle of winter and everything. And I'm sorry you went through that. But like, are the banks or the government keeping that money when people don't get it? Even what happened to the people, if we lost a million people in the United States through the pandemic, I would say 10,000 were homeowners. What happens to those type of monies when th this it's not collected? And is there a way that we can tap into that? And then finally, I want to say, I'm tired of me, us folks, running back and forth every other year begging for money. We are citizens. We are builders and creators of this country. Every single organization from DOT to Homeland Security to uh, Department of Justice should have in their budget, our budget shouldn't just come from HUD, Housing and Urban Development, and then we got to fight everybody for that, plus fight everybody for uh, federal highway money when you ran the highways through our communities. It should be dedicated money for public spaces so that I don't have to be sitting here arguing against something that someone else is doing to empower someone else. But I still feel like we're missing the fact that Black folks in New York City are still a, a priority and not all of us are immigrants. Some of us are just bill penned in our own country. And so, you know, keep in mind when you're talking about uh, immigrants, we are migrants and refugees in our own country. And a lot of times when these conversations happen, we help. We talk about it with you guys. And then at the end of the day, when we think the deal is sealed, 
here comes the Dixiecrats and we could cut out the deal. So that's what I was trying to infer. I'm inferring all the way back to 1877 that we're tired of the political games being played with black Americans here in this country, especially the ones living in New York City public housing, which is also segregated. So you know exactly where we are through your data books. We're in Red Hook, Gowanus, and White Cough, and we demand that we get our units fixed and that we get some equity. And that's it. End of story. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Karen. Uh, fantastic, like much to think about there. Um, just to, I'd love to hear, uh, Rob, I'd love to hear your take on this question. Cause I mean, um, I said uh, the sort of tension between the, you know, kind of day-to-day -day work of, you know, for instance, eviction defense, but also, I mean, more broadly kind of tenant organizing, you know, on the ground things that are kind of more localized, you know, organizing a specific building versus, you know, pushing for systemic change oftentimes through law and policy. I mean, I'm just interested, how do you, do you see those two things as mutually exclusive? Do you, or how do you think they could be kind of uh, wedded, so to speak? So me personally, I never did. And again, I like to talk about the way I'm able to work from a privileged position and work with policymakers, work with students, work with community-based organizations. Not everybody can do that. And I'll start out my work in Rochester, New York. I used to promote myself as a practitioner of direct action and civil disobedience because I believe that the only way we achieve social change in this country was through those actions, right? History proved that. And Karen, I'll just argue that we should go back to you should start at 1619 when we stole land in this country and we were bought here against our will. So, you know, just let, you know, for the record, as they say in the courtrooms. Uh, but I, I think an interesting question you brought up, Karen, is, uh, uh, well, before that, let me finish with Jonathan. I do think there's a tension there, right? Some people fantasize about the direct action and, and how much it, but it's a tactic at all in the end. You know, when, what we did in, and I'll use more when I talk to Rochester, I don't want to go deep into Liz's situation, I know it, but you know, I'll talk about Catherine Lennon because it was very public. You know, that was some popular and political education. We went in there and we educated the community what was happening. And we had a conversation. And when that white woman, 70 year old white woman got arrested by the police, when she said, this is not America, when you physically remove somebody from their house like that, and she got arrested, those pictures went wild. And then the community had buy-in. So much like Liz explained, we went through the same process with Catherine. What do you want to do? The decision is yours. We're here to support you. Catherine decided she wanted her home back. Her and her husband, this was their dream. She had 11 children. She was a matriarch of this family after her husband passed. She wanted her home back. Um, happy Mother's Day, Liz, if you remember, uh, Catherine Lennon in 2011, we did a very public move and moved her back into that house. And, you know, the pictures went viral of the community bringing a refrigerator, two men with a refrigerator on their back, folks with a couch, folks coming to supply that house, the community buy-in, bringing people together to support this family. But the decision was strictly, you know, it was strictly Catherine's, right? We were there to support. Catherine, you got to make this decision. We had all the legal support in the world, everything you need. We have those tools, but the decision is strictly yours and your family. We're just here to support. They're tough. But you know, by the same token, that's not the end all the be all. Like the work that uh, Sia talked a lot about, you know, going to Albany, you have to get in and confront policymakers. And I think the other thing we have to do, which I was never enamored with, is get the right people into elected office, right? Um, you can have all types of people in Albany, but if they're not the right people, they're never going to make the decisions that you need made or that the community is demanding that they make. So. We've also, I talked about the local city level in New York, there's been some changes, but you know, I can, I can name names and you know, Sia will know these names that organizers that we worked with, you know, Marcella Martinez, you know, a, a Latina from Sunset Bar is now in political office. You know, we've been in the trenches together with Marcella, Jabari Brisbane and others like that. So we have to understand our role in electoral politics, even though somebody like Rob is saying he can't stomach electoral politics but we do have to make those political links. 
because if you want to deconstruct the system, you have to be inside of the system and see how it was constructed, right? So it's, I think it's important to understand those processes, right? And so the importance of electoral politics, but it all comes back to me to popular and political education. We have to educate our communities and we have to bring humanity back into our communities. We have to push away the class divide that exists here so strongly that is entrenched in our communities, almost like rust, I like to say. You know, you paint over the rust and you think you educated people, and all of a sudden here it comes again, it starts to surface again. It's like the mold, right, Karen? It just, oh, they came in and they did some remediation of the mold, but then, you know, two weeks later, you're back on the phone, yo, Nigel, what's up? This shit is back, you know? So I think the same thing, you know, when you talk about bringing people together and bringing humanity, right? It's not an easy process. Uh, it's a struggle, you know, but, and I don't know if everything's going to change while Karen, Liz, C, and myself are alive, but we are working to, to create the toolbox for the younger generation to carry on the work, to make things better for the folks who come behind us, because we have certain lived experiences and set, certain work experiences that we know we started this process but we may not be able to complete it, but make sure we leave clear instructions on how the work needs to follow through, right? And, and then finally, I'll say, I do think this, Karen, I don't know how you feel about it. I consider myself an elder. I know people like to hear my voice, but there's times I need to step back, right? And it's not, it's not me you need to hear. You need to hear from these folks, right? So anytime the Indian media now comes up to me and wants a, you know, wants a quote or something, yeah, 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 no. It's about the folks in, you know, the Gowanus houses, right? You want me to go get Beverly Corbin? Or, you know, I, I know Beverly real well, or, or some folks like that are the one that's like, hey, yeah, I'll go get one of them, but I'm not saying a word about it. You need to talk to the people directly affected. So I think there are ways to go about it, but Jonathan, those tensions exist. Um, and sometimes we have to take a step back as individuals and think about it, right? So I've moved away, you know, um, I try to support as much as I can folks doing the direct action because I believe in it, but I'm too old to be out there in the streets, man, raising hell and, and you know, kicking shit down and, you know, confronting police. Um, I, I specialized in it 10, 15 years ago, right? And I'd be more than happy to do it, but I'm getting too old. I can't do it. That's real, right? But then how can I how can I leave tools for others to pick up that work where I left off, right? And that's how I think now, right? So, you know, instead of being a police negotiator, like many people have labeled me, now how can I train people to negotiate with the police at those direct actions? Or how can I say, this is how you do a direct action without getting, without putting people at risk? There's always some risk involved. You never know how the opposite side is going to react, but, you know, you need to think through all of these things and have those conversations within your community and with the people that you're working with. Thank you, Rob. Very insightful answer. Um, so uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for Danielle's question in the chat uh, regarding RAD, um, but uh, it's addressed to Karen. So I mean, perhaps Karen wouldn't mind if I if I put you guys in touch after the after the panel. Okay, I'll be sure to do that. Um, uh, okay, so I wanted to wrap up with um, you know a little note of hope. Uh, I was wondering if we could just go around really quick and just say, you know, 30 seconds on, uh, you know, what gives you hope about the future? What do you think is, is the brightest light kind of, you know, showing the, uh, you know, the better future to come? And uh, hard mode, you can't say young people. <laughs> so whoever wants to start that. You say elder. <laughs> I have no problem being late. I'll just say I'm very hopeful. I see a way to change. I saw after the George Floyd killing how folks went into the streets and folks aligned, right? Um, forces that you didn't expect to align and really made their voices heard. And then I saw comradeship from around the world, somebody who works internationally, the messages of joy and hope or people doing solidarity actions around the world left me inspired and saying the world has woken up. They realized that this quote unquote democracy is not all it promotes itself to be. They saw the problems front and center and they're in solidarity with the people going through the struggle. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So what gives me hope? What came to my mind is faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. 
So faith without works is dead. What gives me hope works. I'm doing the work. My community's doing the work. People like Rob and Sia and um, Liz are doing the work. You're doing the work by educating your classroom. One of the things I love about Columbia is how engaged you are with communities. Um, I do a lot of different studios and talks with students. And though I'm at Harvard, don't tell anybody, I really love Columbia. So those are the things that give me hope, the fact that we can still agree to disagree and that uh, I still see evolution. Uh, I'm a 1960s baby and I see a lot of changes and I'm looking, I have hope that we're gonna see more. That's great, thank you. Thank see you or Liz? Liz, you go. Well, um, I see hope in just um, in the future and I see hope when I look at my kids and see their, um, their, their attitudes change and, um, and when they stand up for themselves. I see hope in um, the work that I do with um, the Citywide Tenants Union. And I see hope in the faces of the individuals who, um, who learn that they do have rights and they stand up and fight um, till the end and win. Um, so in those wins, give me um, hope for greater wins in the future. And um, just building, building consensus and building, um, building better, building more, it gives me hope um, uh, and more opportunity. This meeting has given me hope because I hear um, the stories and I hear, you know, this, you know, this is, this is a good work that we're doing. And um, yeah, there's more to be done. But you know, I'm I'm in it for the long haul, so that gives me hope. Right, thank you. Let's see ya. Yeah, I agree with a lot of what's been said. I think um, doing the work and seeing the movement grow is what makes me hopeful. Um, even though there's a lot that we can critique about how we all work together, and a lot that we wish was differently about how we're all living, the movement is bigger than it was ten years ago or twenty years ago, and that's a good thing. Um, and yeah, I'm hopeful about that. That's great. Um, okay, we will wrap it up there. Only one minute over. Um, I would like to uh, thank the audience who's here and the audience who had to uh, drop out a little bit early. Um, thank you all for watching and for listening. Um, I would like to thank, uh, I mean, Jonathan and I would like to thank Emily uh, for helping to uh, put this event together. Um, we'd also like to thank uh, Matthew Shore and Victoria Lynn, um, my partners in Program Council, for helping to organize this event. Um, and we'd also like to thank Sabina for making the flyer for this event. And um, most of all, we'd like to thank our panelists, Karen, Liz, Sia, Rob. Uh, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Talk to you all soon. For bringing us together. Have a good night, everybody. Thank good you. Night. Good night. Good night. Everyone. Thank you Thank so much. You so much. Good night and thank you. Thank you, Liz. Thank you for sharing your story.